Listen, Talk, Repeat podcast. I'm Wendy Capewell, your Relationship Specialist, and this podcast is all about things relating and affecting relationships. I'll be interviewing guests who are experts in their profession, learning more about what they do and how they help others. In some episodes, I'll be sharing some insights and tips of my own. So settle back and enjoy. Hi, it's Wendy, and today I'm going to be introducing and talking to Susanna Matthews. She's from Kansas in the US. She's a dating coach and matchmaker and claims to be a self-confessed love junkie. Susanna, come and talk to the audience and tell us more. Hi, thank you, Wendy, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, come and spill the beans. <laughs> spill the beans. All right. Confessional time. Well, uh, I, I am sort of a love junkie, I suppose, in that the topic of love and dating and courtship and relationships and interpersonal communications between men and women, that has been my passion, my obsession, my compulsion for two and a half decades now. Wow. <laughs> that is my topic. So uh, initially, I, I just started reading and researching anything I could get my hands on and uh, had done so for a few decades before I realized, oh, there are people who actually make a living doing this and um, who sort of formalize their training a little bit more and then are able to help people uh, in a more meaningful and intentional fashion. So that's kind of how I got my start. Great. So I'm really curious as well because your Facebook page is called Revisiting Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Where did yes. that fit in? So uh, I, I have a Facebook page for The Date Maven, my business, but I also have a separate one for my book, Revising Mrs. Robinson. Mm -hmm. And I published this book about a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago now, after doing, oh, probably nearly five years of research and writing about intergenerational romantic relationships between older mm -hmm. women and younger men. Mm. Yes, because I, I also noticed you have the book with the same title. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because it's quite ex sociably acceptable to for older men and younger women. But if you turn it on its head, people don't find that so easily acceptable. Yes, and so that was a concern and a complaint that I heard from a lot of the women I interviewed. They wondered, why is it okay for my ex-husband or my brother or my ex-boyfriend to date someone 10 or 20 years younger, but I'm getting so much flack if I'm even thinking about it. And I will tell you, Wendy, that in the last seven years that I've been immersed in this subject, I've actually seen some slow shift. I do think that there is, at least in the United States, a little more social acceptance of those kinds of pairings. I don't know if you've been following the romance of Priyanka Chopra, and I think it's Nick Jonas. Right. Uh, she's an actress. He's a pop singer. They have a somewhat significant age gap. And so sometimes we look at these celebrities and maybe we think, oh, okay, that's all right. I could do that too. Or maybe people look at these celebrity pairings and think, well, I have nothing in common with that person. You can, you can live your life that way if you're rich and famous and gorgeous and fabulous, but, but other people don't relate. So that was actually one of the things I was kind of interested in uncovering in my research was uh, what resources do women have if they may not be relating to the Jennifer Lopez's or the Madonna's or the Mariah Carey's of the world, uh, what are their resources for how to conduct that kind of relationship? Mm. So what have you discovered? Well, I have learned a few things that really surprised me and then I have been reminded of a few things that really don't surprise me. Uh, many years ago, I'll say in a different life even, um, that back in my college days, I was very interested in the research around ageism and aging issues, as well as the research around sexism and issues of gender differences. And I do feel that this type of relationship 
puts us at the intersection of our cultural values. I will even, I'll even use that term of ageism and sexism. And these are cultural values that are very tightly woven into the fabric of our, our culture uh, that we, we often don't think twice about the assumptions and the stereotypes that we have based on age, based on gender or sexuality or what have you. And so talking about a woman's freedom to have this kind of relationship or her the, the bravery or the courage that it might take for her to have this kind of relationship sort of confronts some of those ageist and sexist notions of how things ought to be. And it's something about how they should be, how they ought to yes. be. Yes. Anytime we're using the word should or ought to, that's probably something we ought to examine a little closer. <laughs> I agree with you there. I would <laughs> certainly agree. There are three words I would like to bang from the, uh, I'm going to say English language, but I'm going to include the Americans too. But <laughs> All right. Speaking. Um, should, must, and ought, because that's yes. a critical parent inside us, isn't it? It surely it's, is. I'd love to bang those words. Um, I think they are quite damaging, aren't they? They can be, yes. What, what are the different ways that the generation gap shows up or even causes potential concerns? Yeah, well, you know, initially I kind of thought it would just be around how do we want to live our lifestyles? What are the things that you think are fun and what are the, what are the things that I think are fun? And there's far less difference in that. Um, so we all know that uh, there, there's a saying that age is just a number, but I, I, I don't particularly care for that cliche because I think it goes deeper than that. We know people in their 50s who are mm -hmm. vibrant and active and have a rich, spiritual life, social life, physical life, um, intellectual life. And, and then we know people in their 50s who are none of those things. Likewise, we know people in their 20s who are very engaged in life and perhaps mature beyond their years. And then we know people in their 20s who are maybe still struggling to adult and, and to grow up a little bit. So I have really learned to catch myself in my own biases or my own assumptions and sort of filter those that other people bring with them because that age gap doesn't always show up in terms of the way we do dating. Um, do we want to go for a hike or go rock climbing or do we want to go to dinner and have a wine tasting? So your age gap partner may have those interests you need to take the time to get to know them and really discover who they are as an individual separate from their age and not make any assumptions about what they may or may not enjoy based on their age i did find that generations have some different ways of approaching sexuality different ways of approaching etiquette, different ways of approaching finances. And none of these are necessarily challenges that can't be overcome, but they're things just to be mindful of. And maybe just be a little more straightforward about conversationally. Um, for example, I had once dated a younger man who was financially uh, really struggling to kind of get his act together, having a hard time um, you know, just kind of finding a career and a passion and a calling in life. And so maybe a conversation about what do you feel is your purpose and what's your career path and what's your five-year plan and do we need to kind of pick some really budget-minded dating activities? Um, you know, there's nothing insulting about that, but it can be difficult for some people to broach that conversation. But I think that happens with any any couple or just asking that question of, anybody whatever their age is mm -hmm. i think that can crop up quite a lot i know if i start talking to people quite often they say oh that's a really deep conversation if i'm not with clients you know they might be in another setting and they get quite concerned that i'm talking about something more than trivia and, and stuff that's about banal and mundane you know like, wow that's that's really hard stuff so I don't know, is that, what's the difference with an age gap then? I, I'm, I'm curious about that. 
Yeah, well, sometimes it's simply that that younger partner has had fewer years in the workforce to sort of ascend the career ladder and um, their finances just aren't quite as robust oftentimes as their middle-aged or older partner. And that would be true whether the younger partner is male or female, right? Um, so sometimes the women I talk to were sort of accustomed to a different lifestyle that they had lived with their ex-husbands and they just had to make some adjustments about that. Etiquette or chivalry is another topic that, again, I'm not, not here to say that there's a right or a wrong if you're a door holder or not a door holder or um, you shake hands or you don't shake hands, but, but older women may have some expectations about what constitutes chivalry based on the past behavior of their other partners. Younger yeah. men may not know those expectations or they, they may not have seen that modeled to them in their own upbringing. So having some conversations that are kind of reinforce the behavior you want, and this would be true probably of any partner in any relationship, <laughs> saying, I really appreciate it when you step aside and hold the door for me. That makes me feel special. That's, that's a good way to reinforce that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm not hearing anything quite yet. I think maybe the experiences of life, the life experiences, perhaps, when you were talking about finances, I can see that, but the other things you haven't actually convinced me yet there's a difference between the generation gap. So, um, yeah, I want to explore this a bit more because... Well, Wendy, I might, I might jump in and say too that I, I think I have to speak to the elephant in the room, and that is that most people will assume, and probably somewhat rightly, that the sexual chemistry is one of the big uh, draws or attraction points for this kind of couple. And so um, I've, I talked to women who said things to me like, I just wanna be with a partner who doesn't need that little blue pill every time. Or I just wanna be with a partner whose sex drive matches or exceeds my own. And they were not experiencing that with their same age partners. Now that's not going to be true of all older men, but that's what those women were saying to me. Right. Now we're getting to the nub of it. Now, now, we're, now we're getting to some nitty gritty. So the women wanted a, a, a partner whose plumbing worked and worked readily. Uh, <laughs> is it just that? Because I think when you look at maybe older people in that, in that later years, sometimes you see the women, they've really, they're still elegant, they're well turned out, they've paying attention to the way they look. Um, and you look at the guy, a partner, and he's just, it's like he's gone to seed. Mm -hmm. yes. And not bothered and yeah, overweight or, yes, just not even paying attention to his uh, grooming, for example. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's everything, but if he's slopping around in an old pair of jeans and he hasn't bothered to have a haircut, and she's well, why what's the attraction sometimes i just look at them and think i don't get it you know yeah. what what's drawing these this couple together or why would she find him attractive that's a big sweeping statement which women generally they're thinking about the way they their appearance even if they're not glamorous mm -hmm. I think you're right, and my experience with my clients bears that out as well, that many of the, the women, middle-aged and beyond, who are talking to me about what worked and what didn't in their past relationships are making comments about feeling like they were married to a couch potato, or um, she went to the gym, but he didn't, and she went to the waxing salon, and he didn't, and the, the back hair, and, you know, everyone gets a little extra padding in middle age, I suppose, around the middle, but, but it is there is that general sensibility of, of women continuing to invest in themselves, both internally and externally. And I really want to drive that point home that this is not just about the packaging. The women I am working with, they are wanting a partner who has the packaging, yes, but also the inner uh, character, the inner strength, the inner uh, sense of who he is and what he brings to the world, and, and that he continues to strive to grow and develop himself and doesn't sit in complacency, just sort of coasting to, to the end of life. Right. And that's what you're seeing with these um, women that they've been in relationships with, guys who just, they've almost, yeah, couch potatoes. Mm -hmm. They're just not 
almost got into complacency is that what is that what you're hearing i think so i think that's fair i think many times uh, these men have, and, and I'm in no way faulting them, but I think that they've received a message that if you go out and you have a successful professional career and you are the protector and provider, then you can check that box and you have been, a, 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 you've succeeded at life as a man. And then ah, you can sit back and relax. And, and I think that we live in a time where we want and expect more from our relationships mm -hmm. than at any time previously in human history. I think that contributes in large part to the dissatisfaction that drives people apart and drives the divorce rate. We are hanging an awful lot of hopes and expectations on our marriages in the modern age. Definitely, because you look two or three generations back and life was much simpler. It was. A woman, a woman uh, she would probably just want a, uh, a man who would financially provide for her, who was a steady guy, put a roof over her head and just take care of her. Whereas she, he was looking for a good cook, a homemaker, someone who'd look after the kids and be there. And, and I think we demand and want so much more, not only because we're living longer, but because life has got much more complicated if you like we want a lot more so yes I, I agree with you wholly and what we're talking about changes in gender roles here obviously mm. and those changed gender roles tend to be something that those younger men who were dating older women they're aware of them. They embrace them. They had professional working mothers who somehow managed to multitask and balance all the demands of parenting and having a full-time job and sometimes going back to school. And so their perspective on their middle-aged female partners is they are doing it all and, and they admire it. Whereas sometimes for that middle-aged or older male partner, he, he might feel a little um, well, where's my role in this? Does she need me anymore? She's so strong and educated and powerful on her own. And where do I fit in? What do I provide? So maybe it's a part of men losing their way or the older men, not quite sure where they fit in society or in relationships, as you said. Yeah, I think so. And, and I definitely have compassion for that. And, uh, and, and that's something that uh, needs to be rediscovered and processed in coaching. The way that, um, sh I'll just say she and he, I I'm, not, I'm not thinking of a specific couple, but oftentimes if an older woman and a younger man do decide to have a relationship that goes beyond, say, just a sexual encounter, something that's going to be a little more meaningful, they will need to navigate that with their friends in different ways. And that points to a generational difference. So they will have different constituents with different needs. And I'm going to use the word constituents in, in a non-political fashion here. The younger man may simply have parents and a couple of friends who have an investment in who he dates. And he doesn't have a very broad constituent group that he sort of has to explain himself to or justify himself to. He might get a little flack, but for the most part, uh, unless there's some mother or grandmother who's pressuring him for progeny, uh, for the most part, he might experience fewer pressures. The older woman often has not only living parents, but grown or near adult children who are part of her constituent group and friends who are her age who may or may not be as embracing of this kind of relationship. And so she may have to find that she either keeps it a little more quiet, keeps it on the down low from certain segments of her constituent group, or she may simply have to be really mindful about how she frames the relationship and how she presents that to the peanut gallery. Yeah. It's not just the immediate relationship, it's, it's, it's the extended family and friends. The people well, who care about you. They're going to have an opinion. And yeah, yeah care. Or maybe, maybe a judgment even sometimes. Right. You say a positive mindset and a realistic <laughs> understanding of the self, the relationship dynamic and the relationship goals are essential for managing and enjoying a relationship the younger man you made that quote now what tell me more about what that means <laughs> come on well i i know that's a little uh loaded there yeah is it? yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Like the, uh, uh, any coach I've ever talked to, and, and I'm sure this is true of you as well, mindset for relationship readiness and mindset behind how we present ourselves to the world is key, regardless of whether you're dating someone younger, older, or similarly aged. And it has to do with the mindset of attraction and a mindset of what I'll call abundance, abundance that there is enough in the dating pool. There is enough of who and what I'm looking for. And I am enough to bring to this situation. So, so that, that would be advice we would give to anyone, right? Um, but also maybe a, a mindset of being gracious and being a little bit forgiving because inevitably if you are in this kind of relationship for any length of time someone will probably say something that is stupid or snarky and you will have to know how you want to respond to that if you respond by getting defensive and prickly or if you respond by being humorous and laughing it off or if you use that comment as an opportunity to educate the person about what the relationship really means to you and how you meet each other's needs and there will be a different time for each of those things it'll depend a lot on the context and a lot on your audience but I do encourage these couples to think about it in advance how do you want to respond talk about it in advance it may be an opportunity for the younger man to step up and become chivalrous and mm -hmm. defend his lady and it, it may be an opportunity to explain listen I didn't seek out someone younger to consume him or in a predatory fashion. This is a relationship that is dynamic and alive and he is a mature, capable young man and we care very much for each other. And so just kind of knowing what you're going to say before you're in a tricky situation where you have to say it will really be empowering. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because we, if we're wrong-footed, we can become very defensive and it's not helpful. It is because not. Uh, that will probably lead to even more uncomfortable comments or, um, yeah, more upset. More. And, and that will impact on the relationship because somebody could feel really quite, um, they might start wondering about their relationship, you know, having doubts because that's, that seed's been sown. Mm -hmm true yeah our relationships give us context to define ourselves and they give us a process for defining ourselves and so who we choose to partner with means everything because it says so much about who we are it's really a mirror of ourselves and so I think that's part of the discomfort that many women have is if I'm dating this younger man and my friends are giving me a hard time about it and am I being superficial am I being um, careless am i being irresponsible so it really challenges how the woman sees herself so do you think that's part of the work that you do with women for example yeah i do so i think understanding who i am and what i want before creating your dating profile online or or launching that app on your phone that's the groundwork that has to be done regardless of whether you're dating someone who's 25 35 45 55 who am i what what is the gift i bring to the world or the gift i bring to a relationship what are my strengths and weaknesses in a relationship mm -hmm. when you know the answer to those things you can date who you want yeah i think that's it and i think so often i speak to people and I say, what, what is it about you? What, what do you bring to the world? What's special about you? What makes you the person you are? What are your core values and beliefs? Mm. And it's surprising how many of them just look at me with a blank expression. They have no idea about themselves yeah. or who they are. Yeah. So if you do that, how can you begin to have any kind of relationship? Right. I think there's a, a quote or a saying about trying to find a relationship without knowing who you are first is like trying to find the missing shoe of a pair you've never seen or something like that. I, I don't yeah. remember how it goes, but it's, it's definitely more of a search for a needle in a haystack, isn't it? <laughs> definitely. But the, the, it's, I find it so common, at least over here. Um, I, I, I come across it constantly. So it's, it's quite an interesting one, isn't it? If we don't know ourselves, what we want or who we are, I think sometimes it just is that immediate 
superficial chemistry and then younger people seem to think that that's going to carry them through Mm -hmm. and we know that love is something you choose every day it's something you recreate every day and uh you know the 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 intergenerational relationship is definitely a relationship with a lot of lessons available within it and I, i sometimes I'm a little disheartened when someone looks at a relationship and says, oh, it didn't last or it didn't, they didn't get married or it it didn't, it wasn't until death do us part. And to them that they define that as a failure, Mm -hmm. but I don't see, I I don't define failure as something that needed to end. I define failure as maybe a uh, failure to learn or failure to grow or failure to take something from an experience not all relationships are meant to be for life that's very true isn't it um i think there is a real strong feeling around that these days people are wondering whether or not relationships are for life um or whether it is that we're meant to just have different relationships because if you go back to the animal kingdom and and we're part of it Mm -hmm. our whole sense of being in the world is just to recreate our species right and then bring up that offspring till they can fend in the world for themselves and then die and the next generation carries on the species the cycle repeats yeah but we buck the system and we want much more and we live longer so we live beyond like i said two or three generations ago people would not live much longer than in their 40s 50s So now people are living a lot longer. So there's more expectation again, as I was talking earlier, and they want so much more. So is it reasonable? I don't know. (laughs) Throwing it out there. What do you think? I mean, I'm not any of your feelings, but yeah. I mean, certainly as as a dating coach or a matchmaker, I am pro relationship. Yeah. Um, uh, You know, and, and if the relationship is killing the souls or the spirits of the people in it, they need to change it or leave it. Those are the two options. Um, but, but I'm not sure I can say, you know, my own parents celebrated 50 years of marriage and I, I honor them for that. Um, but is it necessarily the goal for everyone? I'm, I'm not sure that it is. And I, I do think we live in a, a time of serial monogamy. I think the social scientists are calling it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the, answer. I don't think there is a hard and fast answer for me. I was just curious to think about what what you felt because it's always interesting to hear other people's views yeah Um, well and and we have to so this kind of harkens back to something that we were saying early on but we have this notion of biological age and chronological age mm -hmm. and chronological age is whatever your driver's license says in terms of how old you are how many years you've been on this planet your biological age has to do with how your body functions so you might be 45 years old chronologically but you get good sleep, you have low stress, you follow a healthy diet, you exercise regularly, um, you are living a vivacious life. And so maybe you have a biological age that's more like 35. So that will really impact how I think people partner. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that. And I, I do see some very old 20, 25 year olds, um, <laughs> emotionally, mentally, yeah. and some very... Yeah, and I and and that's not just at that age. I think it goes across it. You know, all the ages that you can have. It, as you say, it's not the chronological age that matters. It's the outlook on life, and, and so on. Exactly, that really makes a difference. What about if you've got that real age gap? Just something came to mind. Is what about it? Because one is going to age or maybe become their health is going to deteriorate. Does that turn the other person into a carer? Do you ever broach that or come across that situation? I, I missed part of the question. I'm sorry. Can sorry. You sorry. If, if you've got that big age gap and the older person, their health may deteriorate and the younger one then could become a carer. Does and that, that thought about, do you come across that and what? Yes, that thought crossed many of the minds of the women I interviewed. And for, for some of them who had exited their relationship with the younger man, many of those women reported that that weighed heavily on them, that they did not want the younger partner to become a caretaker to them in their older years. Being with a younger man can definitely amplify a woman's body 
consciousness, uh, her sense of how young or old, sexy or not sexy, um, how she sees herself, uh, because here is this illustration right next to her of youth and vitality and sexuality. And so sometimes yeah. that can be that can be a difficult thing to um, manage the pressure of staying in, in shape and staying youthful and what do I look like with my clothes off, right? Uh, so I did hear from women who said I, I didn't want to burden him with what I may be in my old age. At the same time, we know that women live longer and men die younger, just statistically speaking. And there's no guarantee that any one of us won't be hit by a bus walking out the front door. So uh, I actually talked to one woman who said, no, I wanted to date a younger man on purpose because... I think that if he dies young and I'm a little older, then maybe we'll go about the same time. He's the, uh, the love of my life. So that was, that was her strategy. Mm. Yeah, it's just an interesting one that must crop up, I'm sure, because there is all that concern that, uh, yeah, if one gets older, then they, all those thoughts, because I think that happens. I, and we see it with, you know, certain celebrities, for example, where that's happened. And, um, yeah, I just wonder, wonder what it's like. I think it's okay in some respects if you're, yeah, some people can accept it. And I guess if they're financially stable, then that might make it easier because they could get more help and support. But I don't know, there's all, sort, all sorts of things come to mind when I think about it. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, if I'm going to be honest, and I, I, it's, it's not my place to say, hey, everyone, you should go try to have this kind of, like, I wouldn't ever presume yeah. to tell people that. So I'm, I'm not in a position of necessarily advocating this. I'm just trying to help women navigate these waters mm. more effectively. And, and to do that, I think we have to acknowledge that we as humans, we do have a bias. It's a bias that's rooted in evolution. And it is the bias that says that the pair bond that makes sense is a young procreative female with a young, or well, men can procreate throughout their entire lives. So really it doesn't matter, right? But, but that when we have that knee jerk reaction of seeing an older woman with a younger man, it may not actually reflect anything we truly believe. It may be about that knee jerk evolutionary instinct of, well, um, round hips and round breasts and taut skin and shiny eyes, white eyes and white teeth, you know, those are all of the uh, cues to youth and reproductive possibility. Mm -hmm. And when um, that part of our brain that's concerned with survival sees, oh, this, this match, this pairing doesn't make sense, but we're no longer in peril. Our, our species is not going to die out. And so maybe we can just kind of press pause on that reaction and say, okay, the human race is, I mean, <laughs> the population is huge, right? There's no, <laughs> we can come out of the cave now and we can, we don't have yeah. to worry about that. Yeah. I just know it's useful to just explore those things that people might come, you know, might bring to you. Yeah. And, and then concerns because yeah like the elephant in the room there's no point just avoiding and say <laughs> oh, whatever um i think exploring it is really interesting and yeah. and all those feelings that come up for us and those biases and worries and concerns and yeah yeah and and again culture is changing so i don't want to paint a uh, a dark or gloomy or heavy picture um you know you mentioned the title of my book revising mrs robinson the character mrs robinson who is played by anne bancroft in the mm. i think it was 1967 film the graduate it was pretty big here in the u.s i, I don't know if yeah, it was worldwide it was. as well um anyway at the time that that movie was made uh anne bancroft the actor was only about seven years older than Dustin Hoffman, who played the much younger uh, Mrs. Robinson. You know, I think you're trying to seduce me, right? <laughs> seven years is not a huge age it's difference. Not, no. But Hollywood saw it as one. Hollywood saw it as she's old enough to play his mother. Right. So maybe it's that mirror that the media gives us. And do we want to accept that? mirror and do we want to accept those paradigms exactly and i think the media has such a huge impact on the way people perceive things or their views and 
uh, what is what isn't acceptable you know we, it's supposed to be a free world but is it because i think certain things are projected towards us and that's okay and that isn't and um yeah uh they will make such comments and headlines as to what they think is okay and right. a lot of people swallow it whole right right they are um i i'm not going to present myself as an expert on this topic worldwide because i have noticed that there are a lot of uh differences between like african culture and Definitely. middle eastern and indian and pakistani and european so i do kind of watch what gets published in these other nations about the older woman younger man relationship uh, right. and it does seem like the the western countries are perhaps slightly more progressive in this uh, but there are still a lot of really traditional gender norms that are are firmly firmly a hold <laughs> in other countries yeah and, and i think not just about the older woman and the or, or older um younger older woman or younger man situation but equally there are those cultural differences that are very firmly held as you say in those countries it doesn't mean that we're making that judgment at all but just exploring it i think right right i think it's yeah. quite quite nice to just explore it and then people can make their own minds up precisely yeah yeah well and and if you don't mind my adding i i will say um to any women who might be in your audience who have played on the edges of this kind of relationship or maybe they were on tinder or bumble and they swiped left on a guy just because of his age they thought oh he looks so interesting or he looks so cute uh, i would say to them to perhaps just slow down your reaction and come to it with the, the mentality of exploring which is a word you've used a lot and i really like that word and understand about yourself or ourselves that our brains have been wired and conditioned to consider our security and our safety mm -hmm. throughout all and it may be that you're just having kind of a a brain response that has more to do with history than it has to do with the present. Certainly women have always kind of been in charge of our sexual safety and security and our, our physical, emotional, all that. We've had to make a lot of sexual decisions based on our sense of self-preservation. And so we hyperanalyze things and we make things complicated. And on the one hand, I'll acknowledge, hey brain, thanks for keeping me safe. <laughs> On the other hand, um, maybe that that brain could be given a time, give it a lunch break, <laughs> give it a sabbatical from the hyper analysis and, uh, and, and just kind of really think through it a little bit more mindfully and, and exploratorily. Yeah, that's, that's good advice, I think. Thank really you. good advice. I think for whatever relationship that is, I think just, as you said, just those words. Yeah. Is there anything else? I mean, that, that's a really profound kind of statement. There's suggestions there. Is there anything else burning that we haven't covered that you'd like to just say before? Well, I, I think the, the only other thing that tends to come up pretty frequently with this topic is people will ask me what I think about terms like MILF or cougar. Mm -hmm. um, I did use the, the term cougar in the subtitle of the book, and I, and I do want to make clear I wrestled with that <laughs> long and hard. There were women I talked to who really hated the predatory implication of the term and felt that it was sexist, mm -hmm. and I, I tend to agree. Um, there were women who thought it was silly or funny. I tend to think that language is important. The words we choose are important because they not only reflect our reality, but they shape it. They reflect our thinking, but they also shape someone else's thinking. So we have to be mindful about whether we're going to use language that is limiting or empowering. And so if someone is using the term cougar and you don't like that term, you can, you can call them on it. Um, when I was working on the cover for the book and making choices about marketing decisions, I ultimately said to myself, what are the words someone will Google? What are the words someone will search mm. if they're needing information about this? And I had to be honest, the word cougar was probably going to be one of those top search terms. They weren't yeah. going to write out older woman, younger man, or age gap relationship or whatever. So I had to kind of 
selectively, mindfully select the term that I felt like would be responsive to people's searches, because that's what I want. I want this information to be available and to be found by the women and the men who can use it. Yeah. And that, that is the case sometimes, isn't it? It's how we can reach the, the greatest number of people. And those words can, as you say, um, be great. But we can't please all the people all of the time. <laughs> no, ma'am, we cannot. <laughs> Okay, so um, your book is available on Amazon. Is it available in the UK on Amazon? Yes, it is. This is the cover. I'll just ah. hold it up so that people can see what it looks like. It is right. on Amazon.com and I think BarnesandNoble.com as well. Uh, there are some reviews there if people want to kind of take a look at what other readers have thought about it. Brilliant. And I will put all the, your details in the show notes of the um, podcast. But if someone's listening and they haven't got all those details to hand, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you? The best way to reach me is through email. And the email address is Susanna at the datemaven.com. And that's spelled S-U-Z-A-N-N-A at the D-A-T-E-M-A-V-E-N.com. Great. That's, that's wonderful. It's been such a delight talking to you today, Susanna. I, I think we've explored things and, uh, as you said, I've used that word a lot. But I think rather than making any judgments, just looking at the differences and what's useful and what isn't and, the, and, and all of it, I think there's been quite a lot we've covered today. It it's has been, been a delight. <laughs> I've really enjoyed um, talking to you today and I hope the listeners do too. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Wendy, for your hospitality today. Ah, oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Goodbye. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. And you can always listen to others by uh, clicking on my website, www.yourrelationshipspecialist.co.uk and finding the podcast on there. You can also learn much more about me and get in touch or sign up for my newsletter. So until next time, bye for now.